delighted to be able to, uh, to share a bit about the work that we do at Levi Strauss and company, talking about uh, how we capture history from the people who lived it. And you'll get my perspective and take uh, that's perhaps uh, maybe a little more practical on some levels, but hits some of the other points that we've heard in the prior conversations. Uh, and you'll hear uh, what I want to touch on is specific anecdotes and the lessons uh, that we've learned at Levi Strauss from the projects that we've done. Uh, the theme of our conference, Back to the Future, it, I think is an appropriate one for the topic that we're about, uh, that I'm uh, going to be speaking to, and that is oral history. Uh, it is the uh, title of a 1985 movie that you probably all remember. Uh, Michael J. Fox is a character. He is, uh, in, in the movie, his, his name is Marty McFly. He is sent back in time in a DeLorean car that's been changed into a time machine. He goes back to the 1950s uh, where he meets his parents and learns about how they met. And he's wearing a pant that's very popular in the 1950s, Levi's 501 jeans. Take a look at those. <laughs> Uh, we don't have the luxury of a DeLorean to go back in time in a time machine, but what we do have is through the tool of oral history, the chance to go back and hear from the people who lived the history, and it can be done with a tool that's as simple as a telephone. Hello? Hi, is this Larry? Yes. Larry, it's Tracy Panic at Levi Strauss and Company. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Is this still a good time to chat with you about your career at, at Levi Strauss? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited to uh, I'm excited to chat with you. Um, One month into my position at Levi Strauss and Company, which is now uh, going on to its fourth four and a half years. I had my first introduction to oral history at the company. It happened unexpectedly and led me to my first lesson. And it had to do with what had been for a time one of the oldest pairs of jeans, of blue jeans in our collection. This was a pair of blue jeans that date back to 1890, just 17 years after our founder, Levi Strauss, took out the original patent uh, for an improvement in pocket openings. Uh, the idea of riveting pants uh, by adding the rivets into a pocket area. Uh, this pant is one that we'd had in the archives for a long time and had been the oldest for a period of time, uh, the oldest pair of Levi's in the world. And I got a call unexpectedly one day from a woman who wrote this letter in 1948. Her name was Barbara. She'd grown up in Southern California, and as a teenager, she went camping in the Mojave Desert. She decided to uh, explore an abandoned mine in the area. And when she went into the mine, uh, she and her friends found an opening to a room, and they found this pair of blue jeans. She took them home, she patched them up, wore them to high school for two years uh, before she saw the, uh, the inside pocket print that I just showed you. And she wrote this letter offering to donate them to the company. And uh, she and her daughter called me unexpectedly, as I said, a month after I started the job, to say, we are an hour away from San Francisco in Sacramento, California. We will be there in an hour and hope that we can have a chance to see this pair of pants. We invited her in, but I had an hour. I knew this was an important and rare opportunity to get some information about uh, the context of how our early uh, products had been used. So I took out the tool that I have handy, my cell phone, and I recorded in a very rough way her story. And as you'll hear as I start this clip, the audio is not great, but we were able to capture the story, which was the, uh, the lesson that we learned, which was always be prepared. Can you start by telling, telling us your name one more time? What you'll hear, you'll see in that video, is you, you can barely make it out. It was good enough, okay, though, for so tell me. Tell us the story. You had two friends from high school that liked to go. No, the parents. 
Uh, Barbara and her daughter visited. They told us the story, and it's been one that I've repeated in uh, many a media interview uh, about, um, about how our first products were worn by uh, working men from miners, as in the case of this pant that was found in the Calico Mine in Southern California, to railroad engineers, farmers, carpenters, Cowboys, any men who needed tough, durable pants. Getting the context for how these early pants uh, were worn and then reused in the 1940s by a very spunky teenager who wore Levi's to school in an era where jeans or pants were relatively uh, unheard of, uh, worn by women. It was a great story to, to capture. Contrast that with the, uh, with the celebration we had this year at Levi Strauss and Company, 50 years of our original denim jacket. Uh, it was introduced in 1967, this particular style. And we had plenty of information, well, plenty of examples of the way it had developed over time. What you're seeing in that slideshow is uh, examples from the archives of the, the jackets. But when our trucker jacket, as it is called, was introduced in 1967, we had very little information about why the design changed so dramatically. And so the way we were able to capture that information was to invite the designer, uh, Jack Lucier, into the archives to ask him that very question. He's now in his 80s, and we not only invited him into the archives, we also invited our design team to be there. They were very excited to hear firsthand from him the story. It was, it was so simple. And I feel like I'm cheating you by, by uh, coming up here because the, the story is brief. When they made the, the uh, pre-shrunk Levi's and they were going to introduce those, they decided they needed a new jacket to go with it. Nobody assigned a job to anybody. I sat down at my desk and sketched the thing out I sent the sketch over to Mike Salvamini, who was a, uh, uh, a pattern maker and a cutter over at, uh, at uh, 250 uh, Valencia. And he made the pattern. That very simple story uh, was an example of how being the first to create uh, something uh, that has been repeated uh, and copied the world over. Uh, it was really an amazing uh, background for our designers to hear. Uh, we not only learned the story of how this was uh, a jacket that was developed when we introduced our first pre-shrunk jean in 1967 with a zipper, a change because before then you would have to buy uh, an unwashed pair of, of Levi's and then you would wash them. They were shrink to fit. So this was a new variety, and this jacket had specifically been a partner for that, uh, that pant. We also learned from Jack that his father, uh, and uh, to the point about trying to get more of the context through our oral histories, we learned from Jack that his father had also been an employee of Levi Strauss and Company. He was also a designer who had created our famous little red tab uh, that goes on the back of our right pocket or in the case of my, uh, my jacket here, uh, on the pocket right here. So we had not only the context for this, uh, this jacket, but also some additional information. Those two examples of interviews uh, that happened sporadically uh, with, with great time in between told us the value of oral history. We recognized, though, that uh, we could benefit from getting interviews with uh, a, a particular target, the retirees of Levi Strauss and Company, if we actually introduced an oral history project. And that's something that we did last summer. Uh, before I jump to that, let me just tell you that the lesson we learned from Jack is that, uh, that oral histories can help us to fill in key gaps in our, our, our milestones that we have that are important to us. Uh, what, uh, what we learned is that by kicking off a project uh, where you can get benefits of scale, you can get information uh, at one time uh, in a very, con uh, a very uh, concise period of time. We targeted July last summer, two weeks to interview uh, 20 
employees. Uh, luckily, we had the funds to hire an intern. Uh, she was just graduating, getting ready to graduate with her master's, Hannah, and Hannah helped us to do all of the administrative work related to an oral history project, uh, including sending out invites uh, to uh, the target retirees to track who was coming in to our offices and what they were going to be speaking about, to send out uh, sample questions and to elicit biographical information that we could include with the interviews, and then of course to make sure that we had all of the legal documents in order, our releases that were signed that allowed us not only to use the interviews but to keep them and preserve them in the archives for future use. We interviewed a host of people in that two-week period uh, ranging from the employee, uh, the, the manager of our plant, this is Emil Knopf, uh, and he was one of the interviewees, and on the other end of the spectrum, a former CEO, John Anderson, who retired in 2012. And in addition, we uh, had in between a whole host of employees that we interviewed, including uh, one of our designers, her name is Ellen Dunow, and she created the Olympic uniforms that were worn by U.S. athletes in the 1980 and 84 Olympics. She was able to give us insight into why the particular design of the warm-up suit that we created for the athletes uh, looked the way it did. The other thing that the athletes wanted, they wanted a full zip jacket. They didn't, they wanted, because sometimes they were out uh, running or working out in the cold and they wanted to be able to zip all the way to the top. So they wanted that and strong zippers. Um, they wanted pockets and really strong pockets because a lot of times when they're in their warm up suits for 12 hours a day, all their junk is in their pockets. Well, I didn't. I wanted them to not show, but I wanted them to be useful. So I remember her working really, really hard on trying to make a pocket that didn't show. And I think she did a fabulous job because it just sort of you know, fits right in there. Then trying to make it Levi's. So we went with a kind of updated Western yoke. And so that's how this yoking took place. To, and the whole overall design was basically American. Uh, Ellen shared with us uh, a lot of important details about these Olympic uh, outfits, these uniforms that were created in the 80s. We also learned from our experience with her the importance of inviting our interviewees to donate materials to the archives. Uh, Ellen actually brought in her collection of Olympic uniforms, uh, including some of the uh, prototypes that were created. She also brought in uh, original sketches that were introduced to the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, that were used to get the bid. Uh, so a lot of important additions that we uh, were able to get from her. We interviewed at the same time another woman. Uh, her name was Donna Goya, Vice President of Levi Strauss's Human Resources during the 1980s. Donna was not able to be with us in person. We did a telephone interview with her, but she had some incredible information from the early 1980s when in San Francisco in the gay community, we were uh, fighting against the, um, the raging epidemic of AIDS, which we've heard a bit about from some of the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, it was an epidemic that was plaguing our employees, and uh, you'll hear from Donna just what happened during that time. AIDS was another, that, that, that told me how special Levi's was. Um, one of my employees who was gay told me his partner was really sick and we went to visit him in the hospital and there was a skull and crossbones on the hospital door saying danger. You, you, uh, should be careful entering this room. And AIDS didn't even have a name at that point in time. But it started affecting our employees. And this is in the early 80s. Um, like I said, before we even knew the name. Um, and our Bob Haas, God bless him, supported an AIDS task force. He personally manned a table in the atrium for outreach, and we did fundraising, and we did AIDS education to employees. 
Um, and and we were the very, very first Fortune 500 company to offer partner benefits. Donna's interview was wonderful in providing us details about what our former CEO, Bob Haas, had done uh, leading in sharing education with employees to take away the stigma of this uh, disease that was ravaging the community. He also was someone who led other CEOs in America to take a leadership role, and we became as well uh, one of the first companies to offer benefits to uh, our employees who were gay and their partners did not qualify for insurance because they weren't married. Uh, a, a very bold move in an era when, when we didn't know how much insurance costs were going to impact uh, the company. So really great information from that interview. Uh, and we learned uh, through the process of that project that we also gained ongoing benefits from interviewees. In the case of Donna, something unexpected. When we introduced uh, in the fall uh, an acquisition, what you're looking at on the screen is the oldest pair of women's blue jeans in the world. They date to the early 1930s. Uh, this particular pair was worn by a woman named Viola Longacre. Here's Viola here. She grew up in central California, Fresno in the 30s. And while she was attending university, she wore these pants. Uh, she became an English teacher and taught in central California. Uh, the story about this acquisition went uh, nationwide. In fact, in late August, it was told, uh, the story was uh, recorded uh, on India Today, so you could get the news here even in Mumbai. Uh, and our employees, including our retirees, heard the story. And when Donna Goya heard the story, she emailed me eagerly to say that her husband had been a student of Viola. So an unexpected benefit. And in the case of uh, a, an acquisition that we made uh, last year, uh, last fall, this was for the, uh, the pair of 501s that Steve Jobs wore in the 1980s as he was developing the personal computer. Uh, we learned from former CEO John Anderson that uh, Jobs had come into our headquarters in San Francisco regularly to be fitted for uh, what became his uniform. He wore 501s and a black and a black turtleneck uh, as his uniform, uh, especially in the end of his career. A couple of uh, last lessons learned. Uh, one is the importance of considering and anticipating what might be important in information in the future to uh, employees and to, and to uh, um, our uh, company in general. What content should we look for? And the best example of this uh, that we uh, we had taken advantage of is a brand new product we introduced this fall. It's a commuter jacket, and it's one of the first commercially produced wearable technology garments. Uh, it's made with a sleeve that has tiny copper wires that are embedded in the sleeve. They connect with your mobile device. You can touch your sleeve, tap it, and you can listen to music or get directions if you're riding on your bicycle and need to know without looking at your phone, all you have to do is, is make a little motion on your, uh, on your jacket. Uh, this jacket, which took two years of time in our innovation lab with Google, uh, was an important introduction. We expect to do more wearable technology, and uh, I thought it was important enough to go and speak to the head of our innovation lab. Uh, his name is Bart Seitz. And we did an interview with him shortly after the, uh, the product was introduced. And you'll know Bart uh, by his very uh, distinctive blue fingernails. Uh, that's a result of uh, many uh, hours uh, of his hands being in an indigo vat. Uh, a, commuter, a commuter trucker is actually, construction-wise, pretty difficult to make. And um, so we, start, we, we just made sleeves. Um, we would... We would to save time, we, we, Angie would sew sleeves, and then we would sew them onto regular truckers to put them through testing. But that was one of the first, that was one of the very first ones that we rinsed. 
Uh, that uh, interview with uh, Bart also took place when we invited him to donate uh, all of the materials that he had accumulated in that two years of research, and he went through each piece and told us about it. So we got the context of how they had developed the, uh, the project. Uh, a last few, uh, few uh, items that I suspect might um, uh, elicit some debate. Uh, but one, we've learned the importance of many uh, oral histories, and what I mean by that is taking the opportunity when we have people in our archives uh, unexpectedly to ask them questions and record the information that they share with us. And they can be as short as five minutes, and uh, uh, I've found very useful apps on my phone to record and transcribe to do this. Uh, the best example we have is, is pictured in this photograph when we had our head of the women's design team in the archives. Uh, they were looking for a, an iconic um, images for our next big selling t-shirt. Uh, in addition to recording their session where they talked about what is the Levi's look that they wanted, we also at the end of their session with us asked them several questions. Uh, that content we keep adding and uh, it's been a great um, additional benefit of content. We did the same thing when uh, Matt McGivern here uh, that you can see holding uh, with his gloved hands. Uh, two products that 20 years ago he helped design. They're called the Levi's Engineered Jean. We are reintroducing the Jean this year and uh, he gave us some context that uh, we captured on the fly. And by on the fly, I mean he knocked on the archives door one day, in he came, we pulled out some products for him, but I had my cell phone ready to record what he had to say in that moment in time. Uh, it's a great app that I use that not only allows me to capture, to record the information, I can then send the, uh, the information in to be transcribed, get the transcript back as early as the next day. A lot of the uh, material that we get from the, uh, from the oral histories is also used for our storytelling. This is our blog, and we use one of the interviews, uh, this one which took place at the ranch of a former employee, uh, so we had uh, more of his life story in this one as well. So great additional uses. Uh, to, to take us back to the beginning, uh, it is the, that movie, that iconic movie that is the theme of our conference that reminds us that we really can go uh, back in time to help us plan for the future. And I wish you all the best in your work, uh, hopefully doing oral histories. Thanks very much. <laughs>